wait, hold up. David Benavidez brings no money to the table for me. Th this, by the way, is Canelo on David Benavidez via Fight Hub TV. David Benavidez brings no money to the table for me. Just 25 pounds more on fight night. He's nothing to offer me money. But if one promoter who I work with comes and says, I'll offer you 150 to 200 million, I'll fight tomorrow. Again, th that's Canelo on David Benavidez via Fight Hub TV. Damn, did, did Canelo really say that? He ain't never fighting this guy. Th that's how I interpret it. I, damn. What's good? It's Wug. I just saw the Canelo versus Jaime Munguia press conference, and I wanted to share some of my thoughts. When they were near finalizing the fight, I didn't want to just <laughs> I didn't want to just come out immediately with another video that sounded like I was complaining because I, I want to complain. Like I want to keep on <laughs> talking about all the reasons why it should be Canelo versus David Benavidez. I I'm not going to do that here. I might stumble back into giving a couple of reasons why it should be Canelo versus David Benavidez. But I'm not going to make that like what the video is about. I want to react to the press conference. I want to give some initial thoughts on some ways that I could see this playing out and some questions that I have about both fighters going into this fight. So look, on the surface, it's not a bad fight. I want to make that clear. It's not that this is a bad fight. I mean, I have serious questions on to whether Jaime Munguia is, is ready. I don't know if I see Jaime Munguia as being like a top three fighter in the division, probably top five, but I mean, it's a, it's a pretty fun division, especially with the newly emerging contenders out there. But, you know, we've been watching Jaime Munguia's career for some time, and there was never the question on whether he had the physical potential to be like a, a champ. I mean, we saw that he could be a champion when he first made the splash with that win over former 147 pound Saddam Ali. But that was a lot of people's intro to Jaime Munguia. And fight over fight, he's been a pretty fun to watch and pretty violent fighter. Like we've seen him in some pretty exciting fights. The frustration was that we wanted to see him in there with other top five to seven guys at 160, especially. I thought that that was a very uninspiring run at middleweight. And the thing is, I felt like he had the tools to compete with some of the best fighters at 160. Like when Demetrius Andre was a WBO middleweight champ, I thought that him versus Jaime Munguia could be very exciting and interesting and competitive. We just didn't get any of those fights we wanted to see out of Jaime Munguia at middleweight. But in his latest two fights, Sergey Derevianchenko, which was a fight, a fight of the year winner or contender, and then most recently against John Ryder, arguably, I would say maybe Jaime Munguia's most impressive performance to date when you consider the opponent and the type of performance. Granted, John Ryder retired after the fight, but he retired largely because of how that fight went. I'm assuming as much as it was where he was ability-wise and career trajectory-wise. I, I don't have the answer to that. I'm just making my observation-based assumption. But you want to talk about going from like, 20 to 30 miles an hour to 90 to 110 miles an hour. We're going from Sergey Derevianchenko and John Ryder to Canelo Alvarez. So uh, obviously the question is, is Jaime Munguia ready anywhere near ready ability skill wise mentally? You know, like, are the lights going to be too bright? Even though we've, you know, we've seen him headline a few fights. Now he's been a a side marquee fighter for a few years now fighting to, increasingly big crowds and he didn't just melt under those lights but obviously the magnitude is different when we're getting into this Canelo fight like you would see different fighters during the we'll call it the Floyd Mayweather era you would see fighters have a certain attitude and ability and performance in the ring leading up to the fight and then you see how they operated or failed to operate against Floyd Mayweather, some of it because of abilities and skills and everything that, you know, we saw with our own eyes, but also there's a mental component to it, like the change in environment and media obligations and just seeing your idol in the case of Munguia versus Canelo, seeing your idol across the stage from you, interacting with them over, the, you know, kind of seeing how it's done, right? You've seen him operate from afar. Now Jaime Munguia is seeing it up close. Some of Floyd Mayweather's opponents are now seeing it up close as they prepare to fight Floyd Mayweather. So we get like all kinds of underperforming performances from otherwise 
very capable opponents. But look, let me get, <laughs> I, I hate to segue here, but it's just such on the forefront of my mind. Like they asked Canelo regarding why he's fighting a Mexican fighter now and what that means to him. And they didn't ask him in an accusatory way. They just asked him in a, you know, this is an important Mexican versus Mexican fight, a big, obviously a big event. You know, we're all glad and proud and fortunate to be here. What went into or what motivated you to decide to you fight another a fellow Mexican fighter? Canelo, you know, to that said, I didn't want to fight another Mexican fighter, but Jaime Magia has proven that he deserves this opportunity or something to the effect of he's proven himself. And again, that just triggered me because I'm just thinking who has proved their self in that division more than David Benavidez has. So again, like not that Jaime Magia hasn't done nothing, but David Benavidez is coming off of beating Caleb Plant and stopping Demetrius Andre. So it, like, it, look, Canelo has the right to do whatever he wants to do. But when you hear how he's coming across like so dismissive about what David Benavidez brings to the table, for somebody who's talking about wanting to create and establish the greatest, le a great legacy and that being so important to him, how can you on one side say that and then be so dismissive knowing what you know about boxing, knowing what you know David Benavidez has accomplished to deserve a fight with you and then play it off like that and then go fight a Mexican, not a Mexican-American, but a Mexican-Mexican, a fellow countryman in Jaime Munguia. It, it, it's almost like he's trolling the audience who is clamoring for that fight. But that uh, that audience that wants Canelo versus Benavidez is most of fight fans. That's the thing. And you know that this matters to Canelo on some level. I, I do believe that he wants to give the fans something to, more stuff to remember him by. But when you listen to the way he sees his own story, he is talking in a way like he's already done all the proving that he needs to do. And yes, there is a lot of truth to that. But you're holding all of the belts in the division. Everybody else sees the big bad wolf right there in your division for a while on the same platform as you. And you're going to kind of act like this is not important business to be had. You know, either admit that this is a big threat. And look, a boxer, a boxer of his caliber will never admit this, but either admit that it's not worth the risk, which you'll never hear that. Right. But don't gaslight the public in any way suggesting that Jaime Munguia is nearly as worthy of this opportunity at this stage as David Benavidez. Again, I mean, abilities aside, this isn't even accounting for what they can actually do physically or what threat they pose in the ring to Canelo. I'm just saying in terms of on paper, what you've already accomplished. Yes, I do also think that David Benavidez is much more 50-50 in terms of the likelihood that he wins against Canelo than Jaime Munguia is. But it's almost like, don't play us like we're stupid. Don't play us for idiots. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. If you're trolling, uh, if you're trolling or you're just kind of, you're kind of playing dumb in a way because you're either kind of lying, you're, you're either kind of lying or you're delusional. And I don't think it's the latter. I, I don't think that Canelo is so insular that he sees the box, it, it, his place in the boxing realm and sees the boxing landscape that much differently than any other than any other observer like he knows who the next best fighter in the division is so i don't think he's delusional so he's not being completely honest because you could just look at the betting odds like when in doubt look at what the odds say if jaime mcgill was that much of a formidable threat and canelo saw it as such and look i don't know where canelo sees himself in his career trajectory maybe maybe he knows something that we suspect in you know, maybe Canelo is that far over the hill to where Jaime Munguia really does pose that much of a threat. Maybe that's what's going on. But again, we're just kind of speculating because I, I don't feel like we're getting an honest Canelo in this in that context as it pertains to David Benavidez and what he represents to Canelo Alvarez's legacy. I think Canelo is smart enough to know. I believe that he is. And again, check the betting odds on what Canelo versus Munguia is looking like. It's somewhere between like a five to a four to one to a five to one favorite, somewhere in the ballpark of like a four to one to four and a half to one underdog. Jaime Munguia is, you know, interesting note. People forget that Dimitri Bivol was a big underdog against Canelo. Hindsight's 2020, but you know, it's always, I say this in a lot of the live chats, it's important to remember and to go back and look at 
what the odds were and what the perceptions were going into particular fights. So, look, it's not like Canelo hasn't taken risks throughout his career. Eris Landy Lara, you know, uh, to a degree, Austin Trout. Obviously, Gennady Glufkin, like two two fights in near with near prime Gennady Glufkin, 24 rounds, didn't hit the canvas once. You can never take that away from Canelo Alvarez. Hell, I was giving him the benefit of the doubt during that campaign at 168. I had a lot of friends, family members, fellow boxing fans telling me that I was giving too much props and too much credence into what Canelo did against specifically Callum Smith, Billy Joe Saunders, and Caleb Plant. We'll let the Avni Yildirim one go, even though he did make that look totally non-competitive, which is interesting. Same thing with the fight against Rocky Fielding a few years prior. But I looked at those as being very excellent accomplishments. I thought that Callum Smith in particular was a major threat going into that one. So Canelo's obviously done a ton and he doesn't have anything to prove. But if you're still going to campaign, hold the belts and lead us to believe that you are still a A plus, A, A plus level elite fighter, don't then gaslight us into like thinking that it, it, into making us feel like we're crazy because we're like, is it me or is David Benavidez one bad MF? And we would all love to see if Canelo can beat that guy. We all have reason to wonder and want to see that. That's what the boxing world wants and needs. But let's take this as it is. Canelo versus Jaime Munguia. I wonder if Jaime Munguia is going to look like himself in there. Like, I like that he's working with Freddie Roach. I like a lot of the improvements that I've seen. His patience, his uh, fainting, his jabs. He was uh, he boxed well against John Ryder. No, he didn't totally dominate. I mean, he ended up being a destructive force in there. But, you know, John Ryder had his moments. He had swings in a couple of rounds in particular where it looked like he had some good things going. Started making more effective contact with Jaime Munguia. You might start wondering if Jaime Munguia is starting to tire or if this is going to devolve into a 50-50 type of shootout. Not that Jaime Munguia wouldn't win there too because, I mean, he's got a lot of artillery. He throws a lot of hard, meaningful punches. I just wonder if he's going to be too calculated, too respectful, too reserved against Canelo Alvarez where it's either kind of deer in headlights, like not so much because of the magnitude of the event, but because of the nature of the threat in the counterpunch, like this guy can really make you pay. You thought that Sergey Derevyanchenko was dangerous, punching between punches, counterpunching you, catching you kind of clean and unguarded and vulnerable mid-exchange. You thought Derevyanchenko was that. I just wonder if Jaime Munguia could factor in the danger that Canelo brings and still be able to put enough heat on Canelo or is he going to shrink and devolve into a Chavez Jr. where it ends up just being Canelo kind of walking him down and just a listless kind of okay look I'm going to take this L via decision I don't want look I don't want any problems here and let's just all get through this thing safe look I know that hasn't been Jaime Munguia's nature but again Dennis Hogan uh Liam Smith Toriano Johnson all the Gabe Rosado all the guys that he, they are not as dangerous, nearly as dangerous as Canelo Alvarez. That includes Derevianchenko and John Ryder. So I think there's a possibility that we might get a, I don't even recognize this guy type of Jaime Munguia in there if he ends up kind of acquiescing and saying, whoa, I, you know, I got hit by maybe one or two nice counter punches and then Canelo showed me his speed, went to the body, showed me how quick his reflexes are, at least in the early rounds, right? And middle into the middle rounds. But I wonder if Jaime Munguia is going to say, okay, and then kind of fight a, I'm just happy to be here type of fight. Not too dissimilar from Jermel Charlo. Again, it doesn't appear to be his nature. And there's also the possibility that it goes the total other way where he's totally undisciplined and he just starts throwing a ton of punches, gets reckless, gets caught, gets hurt, gets dropped, maybe even stopped. Like that's also a real possibility. You cannot come in guns blazing like that against Canelo Alvarez. And I hope that under the tutelage of Freddie Roach, he's not totally reckless and that he boxer punches. You know, when they say boxer puncher in describing a fighter, I think he's going to have to hit that sort of a balance. It can't be too aggressive. Going too aggressive is how you get James Kirkland. You know what I mean? I do see a possibility of this turning into Canelo versus James Kirkland. So again, you've got to kind of thread that needle. Can't come in too hot and you can't just shrink into a Chavez Jr. versus Canelo type of fighter. Can Jaime Munguia hit a balance? Can he make Canelo work? 
and start burning energy in the first half without getting hurt? Can he put enough heat on Canelo to where you start seeing Canelo start turning really red? You start seeing how much he's sweating, how disheveled his hair looks. You want to make Canelo look like he looked late in the fight against Triple G or in the middle to late rounds against Dimitri Bivol. If you could fight him from distance, from distance, make him work. Start sticking a jab out there without having to, don't go head over skis. Don't commit to everything. Don't try to make every situation a three to five punch exchange. Do enough to make Canelo have to respect you. Think, make him have to move his head. Make him have to work. Just stick the jab out there. Try to use your length without selling the farm and going in and running the risk of getting caught, especially early to middle rounds. Can Jaime Munguia Thread that needle, strike that balance, don't do too much, don't do too little. Can you win rounds without hurting Canelo? Can you give him just enough volume to be uncomfortable, but not too much volume to where, again, you've got your chin out there and are going to get hit and hurt? Can you do that against Canelo? Because look, if you can do that and be competitive, maybe even steal a couple of the early rounds by giving enough volume, but not getting hurt. If you can win a couple early rounds without spending so much energy to where you're a shell of yourself in the second half of the fight, if you could make Canelo work and then make him look like this, this recent Canelo where he looks tired in the second half while preserving enough energy to then start putting your foot on the gas in the seventh through ninth round, then we've got a very interesting fight. I don't think Jaime McGee is going to come in there and blow Canelo out. I don't, I, if Freddie Roach and them are on point with the game plan, Canelo shouldn't be able to just blow Jaime Munguia out early or in the middle rounds. If Munguia could thread the needle and do just enough, give just enough volume in the first half of the fight to where Canelo is tired and reduce or diminish, not because he got hurt or wobbled, not that kind of reduced and diminished, but you are tired in the second half of the fight and then you have enough in the tank to then put your foot on the gas again. That will be interesting. So that's the main question. If I had to guess right now, I'd have to go Canelo Alvarez, but via decision, not stopping Munguia. I think that him and Freddie Roach are going to be ready for this. I, I'm hoping that he doesn't turn into that kind of let's just shell up. Like, you know, I said Chavez Jr. versus Canelo. I don't want to see that. And another fight that you could point to was Joshua Clotty when he got to fight Manny Pacquiao. Like he was the first guy out in several fighters to take Pacquiao the distance, but that's just because he was here. Shaking his head, no. He was here. All fight, Joshua Clotty was. Even that version of Manny Pacquiao wasn't going to stop Joshua Clotty on that night. So I don't want to see Munguia avoiding Canelo, you know, throughout the fight to survive. I don't want to see that because Canelo will walk you down if he has you spooked. There's a chance we could get there. But yeah, if I had to guess right now, I'm thinking Canelo via decision. But yeah, let me know what your early thoughts on this one are. Did you see the press conference? What are your thoughts on this fight being made? Again, on its surface, in a vacuum, without the context. If you just look at that fight, it's not a terrible fight, but given the landscape and given the context, it feels all type of wrong. But, you know, Canelo's got the right to do Look, I was hoping if not David Benavidez, then maybe we get the weird kind of three division apart fight with, between two legends, really, Canelo and Terrence Crawford. I would have been open to that. Anything else would have just been like an, it would have just felt like an avoidance, really. And I think that that's, that that's really how I feel about this one. Again, it's not a terrible fight, but that's, very unfortunate that now that, you know, Benavidez is probably going to go up to 178, might fight Gvostik. I don't see him being viable at 168 comfortably where he can make weight and perform well at 168, given his, you know, he's getting into his mid 20s now and he's getting bigger naturally. I'm surprised he's been at 168 for as long as he has. I just feel I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that the window of opportunity might have already expired and closed to get Canelo versus David Benavidez. Because I'm thinking if Canelo is not going to fight Benavidez at 168, he damn sure ain't going to go up to 175 and fight that guy. I don't think that we're going to get... And Canelo even mentioned, you know, what does he bring to the table? All he's going to bring to the table is weighing outweighing me by like 20 pounds. I, I think I saw Canelo say that. So that gives a little more insight onto how he views this. But, you know, but you're going to, you know, entertain a fight with... Ilunga Jr. Makabu at one point or, you know, fight 
Dimitri Bivol, you know, and he's open to fighting Better Be I think he had mentioned the possibility of the Better Be versus Bivol winner. But for some reason, David Benavidez just isn't worth it. Look, and his thing is, well, look, if I beat, De De if I fight David Benavidez and I beat him, there's always going to be that next guy you point to. I'm like, look, I get what you're saying. Yeah, there's always the next hurdle to climb, always the next mountain to scale, all that. But like, no, I think fight fans would actually be like, yo, okay. Okay, seriously, if you if Canelo fought Benavidez and whether he won or lost in terms of, oh, there's always going to be the next guy. It's not like it's, I don't think the public would automatically pivot and say, well, fight David Morrell or fight uh, Diego Pacheco. I don't think that that's where we would go with it. I think given Canelo's age, given how good and how long David Benavidez has been good. I mean, he was a two time champ from a few years ago. He's been around for a while. It's not like he just uh, emerged on the scene. He just didn't happen to have a belt in the moment that Canelo was collecting belts, unfortunately, for Be Benavidez. And, you know, through no fault of Canelo's, even though some people suspect that he wouldn't have done that same rampage and try to become undisputed. I'm not going to go there. But, yeah, it's, I just fear that the opportunity might have already expired and now canelo could say you know well he went up to 175 that's not my problem i'm here i'm re ready to fight you at 168 and you know who knows david benavidez might still try to get down i just once he goes to 175 i've got way more questions on whether they could fight at 168 and benavidez be at his best and the last thing before i wrap it up how, why did PBC sign Canelo and not have David Benavidez be a part of it? I get it. Just get him in the door, right? Say you can fight whoever you want. But why would Canelo also be so insistent on fighting a, hey, I just came back from a three-year out-of-the-ring absence type of Jamal Charlo? You, you want to fight him now? We've been wanting to see Canelo versus Charlo since 2015. And you're going to choose this time <laughs> to want to say, yeah, that's I want that to be a part of my PBC deal? Like... Come on. And I get it. It's not Canelo's fault that Jamal, you know, that it sounded like it was agreed to. Then Jamal pulled out and then Jamel entered. But then to go from Jamel and then want to fight Jamal, again, given the landscape at 168, I, I just ain't feeling it. But yeah, let me know your thoughts on Canelo versus Munguia, the fact that it is happening, what you expect the future to look like. And if you think that Canelo versus Munguia at this stage of Canelo's career can be competitive. And if, if Munguia has a real shot at beating Canelo, let me know your thoughts. Like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. I'm Woog. Thanks for tuning in.